Alan, we hear today about multiple universes, not just bigger parts of our universe, but literally universes that are so different from ours or so apart from ours, there's no communication. It's, it, it's like a virtual other kind of reality. From the standpoint of hard science, particle physics, cosmology, what are some of the mechanisms by which multiple universes could possibly be created? Uh, certainly one of the mechanisms that can generate multiple universes comes out of inflation, so let me talk about that. Uh, inflation is a twist on the Big Bang theory that describes the early history of our own observable universe. Uh, it proposes that our universe began uh, with a period of exponential expansion driven by a peculiar kind of material that actually creates a gravitational repulsion, which is what causes this exponential expansion. Uh, then, in the inflationary picture, uh, the exponential expansion ends because the material that's driving the repulsive gravity is unstable, uh, so it decays, like a radioactive substance decays. Uh, now, by decay, I don't mean that it turns into something rotten, I just mean it turns into ordinary matter that uh, is produced by the decay. Um, now, the reason this leads to multiple universes uh, is that the process by which it decays is really very similar in nature to the process by which any radioactive substance decays. And as we all have heard since grade school, radioactive things have half-lives. And that means if you wait a half-life, on average half of the material will have decayed and half will remain. And you wait another half-life, again half will disappear. Um, and same for this peculiar repulsive gravity material in the early universe that's driving the inflation. But there's a catch here. Uh, which is that this repulsive gravity material, because of its repulsive gravity, is at the meantime uh, undergoing exponential expansion at the same time that it's decaying. And this exponential expansion is faster, and in fact much faster, uh, than the exponential decay. Uh, so to put it in, I think, pretty simple terms, if you wait for one half-life of this unstable material, uh, indeed, by definition, half of it will decay by the end of the half-life, uh, but the half that remains, because of its exponential expansion, will in fact have a larger volume than what you started with, in fact a vastly larger volume. So even while you're watching it decay, uh, it's growing, uh, growing in volume exponentially. Uh, so pieces of it decay, each piece that decays produces a local effective universe, which we usually call a pocket universe. Uh, but at the same time, when one piece decays, another piece nearby does not decay. Uh, only half of it decays in the half-life. Um, so the pieces that don't decay go on exponentially expanding, and they decay in pieces later, uh, continuing to produce these pocket universes uh, literally ad infinitum. If this picture is right, we see no end to it. Uh, it appears that it's going to produce literally an infinite number of pocket universes, uh, each one of which, by the way, would be on average at least vastly larger than our observed universe. So our observed universe would just be a small speck within one of these pocket universes. This and is then so, there'd be an infinite number of others. This is so incredible. So let me just get some things straight. First of all, when you're using this term pocket universe, that's a big thing. That's right. Right. A so pocket your pocket universe, universe big, big thing. Big it's pockets. Even bigger than <laughs> our observable universe by, by huge orders of magnitude, yes. it's a pocket because it, it, it's distinct from all these others that are developing. That's right. The other key point is that as inflation goes on and you have this half-life and you're losing half of it, the expansion is much bigger than that, so you will continuously have more stuff. But the key element here is that you're, you're expanding it, and the normally we, we, we think if it's, this, if it's uniform stuff and it expands, the, the, the density gets less and therefore it gets weaker, but this is not the case. That's right, that's right. One of the peculiarities of this repulsive gravity material is that even while it's undergoing this vast expansion, the density, the number of grams per cubic centimeter, uh, remains fixed. Now that sounds like it must violate the conservation of energy, because energy and mass are the same thing, equals mc squared. Um, and you wonder why a professional physicist would be talking about something that obviously violates <laughs> conservation of energy. Uh, but in fact, it does not violate conservation of energy. Uh, there's an important uh, loophole, let's call it, to the principle of conservation of energy. Uh, energy is exactly conserved, that's not the loophole, uh, but when one thinks about conservation of energy, uh, it's a normal reflex to think of energies as always being positive. So the only way you could have a lot of energy is to have started out with a lot of energy. 
uh, because it's conserved and if it's always positive, you, it's the only way to do it. But in fact, uh, energies are not always positive. Uh, and in particular, the gravitational field has a negative contribution to the energy. Uh, and furthermore, although it's hard to believe, uh, if we look at our observed universe, uh, the negative energy in the gravitational field that fills it, there's a lot of empty space, that's the important catch here, uh, the energy in the gravitational field that fills it uh, is in fact consistent with perfectly balancing uh, the positive energy uh, of all of the matter in the stars and galaxies and everything that we see. Uh, so the total energy of our universe, we believe, is consistent with being exactly zero. And during this inflationary process, in our theory, uh, what's going on is that as inflation takes place and the volume of this region is getting exponentially larger and larger, doubling and redoubling and redoubling, uh, more and more energy is being put into the matter that fills this region, this peculiar repulsive gravity material, which later becomes the normal matter. Uh, but at the same time, more and more negative energy is being put into the gravitational field that fills this region. And the total energy that's being input as it grows is zero, with just a perfect balancing between the positive and negative contributions. And that enables us to generate multiple universes, these pocket universes that get squeezed off from one another. That's right. And, and we know that if inflation generated our universe, this process continued, so from that time, there's innumerable universes, pocket universes have been generated since it occurred in, in our universe some 13.7 billion years ago. That's correct. And there's been- Assuming, of course, that this theory is right. Assuming it's right, right. And, and, and we've had this enormous progress in which the number of multiple universes arguably continues to increase. I mean, the, the density of the creation of them increases. That's right, the rate at which they're created actually increases exponentially. Over time. Yeah, and can we say anything about multiple universes be before our universe existed as well? Well, it certainly is not very plausible if there's an infinite number of these pocket universes that we just happen to be living in the first. <laughs> Odds of that, I guess, one over infinity. Um, so I, I think it's highly plausible, maybe even essential, to believe that our universe was not the first, and therefore there would have been a prehistory uh, to the origin of our own pocket universe.